Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Maureen Conway. I'm a Vice President at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Economic Opportunities Program. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's book talk with Eduardo Porter discussing his book, American Poison, How Racial Hostility Destroyed Our Promise and the important implications of that book for our current context. This conversation is part of the Economic Opportunities Program ongoing Opportunity in America discussion series in which we explore the changing landscape of economic opportunity and the implications for individuals, families, and communities all across the United States. I want to note our deep appreciation to the Ford Foundation, Prudential Financial, Walmart, the Cerdna Foundation, and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for their support of our Opportunity in America series. At the Economic Opportunities Program, we focus on advancing strategies, policies, and ideas to help working people and small businesses thrive. And working people and small businesses are facing extraordinary challenges today, with over 26 million recently applying for unemployment benefits and millions of small businesses at risk of closing for good. At the Economic Opportunities Program, we recognize that for too long, race, ethnicity, gender, and place have played an outside role in who has access to opportunity and who is shut out. And we see today Black and Latino workers being most affected by unemployment and by the health risks that come with being classified as an essential worker. We see Black and Latino-owned small businesses facing much greater vulnerability to the economic devastation of COVID-19 and more challenges accessing funding to help get them through. So in today's book talk, we'll be exploring some of the history and dimensions of America's racial divides, how we are seeing the consequences of our, exclu our exclusionary choices play out now, and how we can perhaps emerge from the current crisis not to return to what for far too long we've accepted as normal, but to a healthier society and a stronger economy and to a fuller expression of our nation's ideals of equal opportunity and shared destiny. I am so grateful that so many of you have chosen to join us for this conversation. Registration for this event has been tremendous and it's included people who are different in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, and age from over 45 states in the District of Columbia, from big cities and small towns, from nonprofits, businesses, research institutions, government agencies, education institutions, philanthropy, and more. At a time when we are struggling with so many fissures and divides in our society, it gives me hope that all of you chose to come together for today's conversation. And just a few notes before we start today's conversation on our technology. Everybody attending today is muted, but we very much welcome your questions. Please use the Q&A box on the bottom of the Zoom window for questions or comments. Uh, there's also an option to enable closed captions, so if you'd like to avail yourself of that, please do so. Um, uh, we encourage you to tweet about this conversation. Our hashtag is talk opportunity. If you have any technical issues during this webinar, you can chat with uh, my colleagues or email us at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared via email and posted on our website. So for today's session, we'll begin with opening remarks from Aspen Institute President CEO Dan Porterfield. Then I will pose some questions to Eduardo about his book. Um, some of my questions are drawing on the questions that many of you submitted. Uh, thanks very much for submitting questions during the registration. And then the balance of the event will really focus on the, on the audience questions and my colleagues uh, behind the scenes, I just want to thank them very much uh, for their extraordinary help in, in bringing these events together. Uh, it's a lot of work and we have a great team here. Um, so they'll be organizing questions and feeding them along to me. And please note that you can also upvote questions on. So if there's a question that you particularly want to see addressed, um, you can give it an upvote. Okay, so now it is my uh, wonderful privilege to introduce Dan Borderfield, President and CEO of the Aspen Institute. And I know today's conversation is near and dear to Dan's heart. So Dan, we really appreciate you joining us today and I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Maureen. Uh, thank you to all who have made this event possible, uh, especially Eduardo Porter who wrote the great book that we can uh, uh, dig in and talk about with him. Um, the uh, Economic Opportunities Program at the Aspen Institute it has been 
leading the charge to make sure that we, as members of a society, um, ask ourselves the hard questions constantly about what is it that we can do collectively to promote a free, just, and equitable society. And those are big words. And the history of the, of the American experiment has been to call up those ideals and then honestly to fall short of them in so many different ways and times. Uh, I say that not as an indictment, I think, but as a statement of fact. Um, concepts like structural racism, unconscious bias, white privilege um, are incredibly powerful for understanding the reality that we're in the, the, and the, the way we live in today's world. It's been a part of this country's history from its very founding. There's so much to understand about this and there's so much to think about. And then when you say, you know, given how much racism and other forms of prejudice have defined the American experiment. How do we understand our history in a way that could allow us to break free from repeating some of the dynamics of the past in order to create a more just, a more inclusive, a more equitable, a less discriminatory society? Um, and I think Eduardo Porter is one of the most clear thinking uh, social analysts I've ever come across. I remember a few years ago reading one of his pieces in the New York Times and reading it like five times over. It was so rich with uh, economic analysis and social theory, so learned and so thoughtful and so, so hard hitting. And I can't remember now if it was around uh, the challenges of ending or uh, addressing rural poverty or the biases built into the economic system or the challenges in claiming that education can genuinely lead to social mobility the way it's practiced in this country uh, or something about the tech revolution. But whatever it was, because now <laughs> I've read everything since then. And every time I read his work, I feel like yeah, I need to sit down and get very quiet and very still and let myself think. That's quite a gift, Eduardo. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, well, thank you, Dan, so much for joining us today too. And we really appreciate you taking the time and, and, your, and your leadership in challenging all of the Aspen Institute to pr pursue a more free, just and equitable society. So thank, thank you. you so much. Um, and uh, so, and that was a great uh, little bit of background on, on Eduardo. Um, mine was a bit much more straightforward. Um, just for those of you quickly who don't know Eduardo, uh, Eduardo Porter is an economics reporter for the New York Times, where he was a member of the editorial board from 2007 to 2012, and the economic scene columnist from 2008, 2012 to 2018. He was born in Phoenix, grew up in the United States, Mexico, and Belgium. He began his career in journalism as a financial reporter for Notimex, a Mexican news agency in Mexico City, and also worked for America Economia, a Latin American business magazine, and for the Wall Street Journal before joining the New York Times. And most importantly, for the purpose of this conversation, Eduardo Porter is the author of this book, if you can see it. Um, how American Poison, How Racial Hostility Destroyed Our Promise, which you can get shipped to you in hard copy, as I did, um, obviously, or you can read the ebook version, or you can listen to the audio version, which I also did and can recommend. Actually, I can recommend them all. They're all good. Um, so many options available for you. So Eduardo, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really a pleasure to have you and to see you. Um, and so the first and kind of obvious question for you is, so for you with sort of your significant and global career in economics journalism and business reporting, um, how did you come to write a book about the role of racial hostility in America? Thank you, Maureen, for this introduction. Thank you very much, Dan, for your kind words. Thank you, everybody, for, for being here and listening. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to get the word out about American Poison before this amazing audience. And I do hope that you find my thoughts compelling. <laughs> so I have two stories to kind of answer your question. One is old and one is relatively new. So please bear with me for a minute. So my awareness of the American social contract started sort of taking shape, you know, hazy and inarticulate when I was a kid. I lived in Mexico. I moved to Mexico when I was six to be closer to my mom's family. But I came back to the US uh, pretty much every summer 
to Phoenix to visit my, my grandparents who lived there. And one of my first images of the United States, or at least one of the first images that I can remember having was their house. It was not really fancy, you know, it was in a working class neighborhood, you know, pretty far from the money. But, you know, it had this wall to wall carpeting, it was, you know, air conditioned all the time, had this big TV and a cassette deck and an eight track technologies that most of you have probably never heard of, you know, had a huge refrigerator and they had a pickup truck and a Pontiac and a trailer, which they would, you know, take up every summer to Sedona and, you know, park at this trailer park overlooking the Oak Creek, you know, and, you know, just to, my, they were not rich. Uh, my, my grandfather was a retired electrician who had moved from Chicago to Phoenix to work on the Salt River Project. And my grandmother was a librarian. They had stories to tell about soup kitchens during the Great Depression. Um, but, you know, they were retired on Social Security and they lived a, a frugal life, but it was really not an uncomfortable one. Now, and I remember being there with them and, and thinking that where I lived in Mexico, Electricians didn't get anywhere like this kind of life. Um, I was raised in a privileged situation, but in a country with enormous inequities. Um, and, and comparing that Mexican reality to, you know, my grandparents' house, the electrician's house in Phoenix, I kind of was forced to accept that the American social contract was better, you know? Like no other country I knew, and actually no other country I came to know for a long time after that, it, 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 it seemed to have created, uh, succeeded in offering, you know, ordinary working class people a true shot at prosperity. And then, you know, in the 1990s, at the end of the 1990s, I returned to live in the United States um, uh, after, after college and having lived in a few other places. So when I got here, I lived first in New York, and then I moved to LA for a few years, uh, writing for the Wall Street Journal about Latinos in the United States. And what struck me then was how little America resembled these childhood memories I had, you know? And, and as a reporter, you know, pouring through the poverty stats and the numbers on showing Americans really dismal health, a situation, uh, statistics about kind of like really um, um, threadbare social cohesion. The idea that then that kind of like took over in my mind was how could a country this rich provide such a crummy deal to so many of its people, you know? And so I came to kind of understand that, that my grandparents really lived an exception. It was not the rule. They achieved their prosperity through a really narrow window of opportunity within a few decades after World War II. I also now understand that that window was really narrow because it was really only open for whites. And the question that popped up from my mind at the time and that I've been chewing on for ever since then and from which this book ultimately emerged is why did this window close when so many Americans were still on the outside? You know. And it was around then that I kind of took interest in a lot of the social science about racial divisions. You know, there was a lot of, there's been a lot of research by economists, by sociologists, political scientists, psychologists, um, about kind of like how intense racial divisions are in the United States. I mean, you can call them, there's a bunch of names for them. You can call it contempt, or you can call it fear, or bigotry, racism. But there was all this research about how these feelings stand in the way of developing the kind of empathetic, empathetic thinking that underpins the sort of like richer social safety nets that help pull other societies together. You know, there is research about how immigrant kids entering public schools in, in California encouraged American parents to pull their kids out and put them in private schools inst instead. There's research about how cities with more diverse communities spend less on public goods like trash, trash collections and, and street maintenance. Um, there's re research on how white Protestants put less in the collection basket at church as a share of blacks in their congregations rose. And so my aha moment, like kind of the epiphany uh, was, was when, when I was living in LA, uh, um, you know, which was a, an enormously balkanized city. 
Um, and, and looking through these stats and looking through the kind of like the dismal social and health outcomes and economic outcomes for much of the population of the United States, you know, the thought that gelled in my mind is, why doesn't the U.S. behave like the prosperous country it is? And my conclusion, I couldn't really quite escape the conclusion, was that racial divisions just got in the way of empathy. Now, that's the old, long, admittedly, part of the story. The new side of the story, and I promise it's shorter, uh, um, happened just a few years ago um, when Donald Trump decided to run for president. From his very first speech, where he blasted Mexicans as rapists and thugs streaming illegally over the border, the president has worked really hard to rekindle the racial and ethnic divisions that lay just below the surface of our political consciousness. You know? you know, his overt racial appeal to racial animus came to me like a slap in the face. You know, it reminded me kind of abruptly of how racial hostility could further poison our future as demographic change transforms our racial and ethnic reality. You know, in, in those speeches, you know, Trump portrayed himself as the voice of white America, you know, that America which has forever held the reins of power, building the walls and pulling up the drawbridge to stop the rise of a truly multi-ethnic, multiracial nation. And witnessing such a large share of white America circling the wagons to kind of protect their historical privilege, I mean, I felt I just had to write this book, you know? I just had to make the case that these politics have forever damaged the fabric of the nation. They are undermining our social contract and they're really, in my view, turning us into a failed state. Yeah. So I, yeah. I guess that was a bit of a long answer <laughs> to your question. Yeah, but that's really, one. those are my motivations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so I just want to do a little on terms. I mean, your, your title notes kind of the issue of racial hostility. The book starts actually with that story of backlash against immigrants, mainly against, against Mexicans, um, you know, which some might call a ethnicity divide rather than a racial divide. So can you just lay out a little bit about how you think about the concept of race versus the concept of ethnicity and and do you see these categories kind of shifting or changing in some way and I'm also just curious sort of you know as you worked on the on the book did did your sort of understanding or sense of, of what race means did that change at all as you were working on this um, that's a really interesting question Maureen and it, it's a question that you know people at the Census Bureau have been like grappling with forever um, as a little aside I remember covering the uh, re results of the 2000 census. And as part of that coverage, I, I, I discovered that they had had all this trouble about whether they were gonna use an, eth an ethnicity question alongside the racial question. Was it gonna go before the racial question or after the racial question? And how, how they decided to frame this, where they decided to put it, whether they decided to include it or not, was gonna really alter the, the distribution of, of responses. And so, I mean, one of the conclusions that I draw from this is that race is really kind of like a social and a political construct. It's not like a biological truth. It's, it's more like a, a product of, of our political understandings, our social relations, and at the end of our, our, our bureaucratic organization, you know? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and just to answer how I think race fits alongside ethnicity, in a way, I, I think as a social and political construct, as, as, a, as a tribal dividing line, um, they're kind of indistinguishable. You know, um, they are, um, and, and, and in fact, the, as, a, as, a, as a system of political organization, you can say that they also share um, things with religious difference and, you know, other cultural differences or, you know, differences in language. These, I think that the way that they, they shape our society and they shape our politics are by bundles of otherness, you know, um, and, and it with, w that are used for organizational purposes to, you know, to preserve uh, the, the power and the privilege of one group versus another. Uh, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so I, I, I started off, even started off with this book um, with a sense that, you know, I, I don't think that there is a really relevant difference between these two terms when it comes to how they've been used to organize American society. 
And I came out of writing that book even believing that even more strongly. Um, and especially by, you know, like looking at the political narrative out my window and how, you know, arguments that have been used in a very specific race, racial, black, white racial context were now being deployed um, against uh, Mexican uh, immigrants, which on the census form can put whatever race they want and they have their own little ethnic box, which is Hispanic or not Hispanic. It seemed to me that these things were just basically, you know, bureaucratic differences that did not really have any specific social or political uh, um, reality of their own. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of Thanks. course, you know, the most consequential racial division in the history of the United States is that between whites and blacks. Well, even as I'm saying that, I, I, I feel that I'm, I'm being remiss for, for uh, uh, not referencing the, the history of, of racial violence against Native Americans. But to be fairly honest, to be very honest, it is, it is an experience that I did not cover in the book. It is an experience that I am not uh, uh, very well educated in. But just to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 but you know, even as I, as I say this, I also say, well, the, 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 the black-white racial dividing line is not the only one. It's hardly the only one. Racial otherness has been deployed by whites to assert their privilege versus Jews and Central, Southern, and Central and Southern Europeans in the early decades of the 20th century against the Chinese and against the Japanese and, you know, very definitely up to, you know, very recent speeches from our current president against Mexican and Central American immigrants. Yeah. yeah. Categories, yeah. you know, just to, the ambiguity of this all, that these categories are actually not even very solid in time or place, these shifts. So Italians and Southern Europeans were the racial others in the American Northeast of the early 20th century, you know? And in fact, if you think of the Immigration Act of 1925, it was basically designed to stop Central Europeans and Jews from coming into the United States and Portuguese and, and, and Italians. Um, but then these groups whitened over the course of American history as they became richer and, you know, as some research has found, the great migration of African Americans from the South into the Northeast and the Midwest encouraged white America to invite, you know, the Jews and the Central Europeans and the, and, and, and the Portuguese into the fold of whiteness. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. so, so I, I in, in, just as a final thought, I think that for a long time, the debate over racial divisions in the United States has kind of missed this part of the story, this part that there is a lot of complexity around the notion of racial division. Um, and I think it's critical today to acknowledge it, you know, because as I think I pointed out a moment ago, I think that immigrants, especially, you know, poor immigrants from Mexico and Central America, you know, the guys picking your strawberries and delivering your seamless are amongst the most vulnerable racial others today, directly threatened by the president and his supporters. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I like that bundles of otherness and it just sort of how you want to bundle it is changes over time. Um, I want to shift a little to, you know, you one of your con uh, contentions in the book is sort of that the weakness of our social safety net um, stems from this sort of legacy of racial animus. And I'm wondering if you can just kind of un unpack that a little bit, you know, you sort of, uh, you've spent some time in, in Harlan County, Kentucky, and maybe you can sort of say, so So, how does that work for people there to somehow be convinced that it's important for them to deny people a benefit that, you know, they don't even know, don't even live in their county, um, and, and by so doing end up de denying themselves that, that very same benefit? How, do, how, do that how does that process work? Can you unpack that a little? Okay. Um, um, so, so you know, just to to um, um, uh, just to just just to come clean here, I, I am not. I don't have any training in psychology, and I did not really explore the individual psychology that leads to these outcomes that you're talking about, these attitudes that you're talking about, and I think that is a shortcoming of my book. Um, I just kind of like just went and looked at them and saw that they were there, but I have very little understanding of, you know, how does an education that's permeated with racial memes and racial, racially coded thoughts help to, to create an, a character that includes, you know, that, that, that has uh, such very, very deeply embedded uh, um, um, racist biases uh, um, as an adult. But, but, um, 
but the, the contradiction does very much, you know, come to my mind. It's one of those things that really slaps you in the face. Um, because, you know, what is true is the people in Harlan, Kentucky, uh, are, are some of the people that are most reliant on federal aid in the, in, in the entire country. You know, there's like 10 counties in the United States, maybe 11, where over half the personal income uh, on average of people there comes from federal programs, you know, from food stamps to social security to Medicaid. And Harlan, Kentucky, I mean, more than 50% of their income comes from the feds, consistently votes for politicians that oppose big government and any sort of expansion of the social safety net. I mean, I was there once uh, at a town hall when the past governor, who was a, a Tea Party stalwart guy called Matt Bevan, and he was there, you know, talking about bears in your trash and, you know, with a, a group of, of locals gathered around there and everybody was like kind of like grunting and assenting. And suddenly he went, he kind of like started talking about how, how undeserving people were taking advantage of Medicaid and like laying on their couch and getting handouts from the feds. And the people in that audience really came to life, you know, the applause rippled through the hall. It was like an, a crazy change in, in energy, you know? Um, and, 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 and I think that though, though Harlan and other similar areas in Appalachia are really overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly white. Um, I mean, I think Harlan is like, in the census comes up at like 97% non-Hispanic white. I think nonetheless, their opposition to bigger government is still couched in that kind of, of rhetoric about undeserving others, lazy others, you know, corrupt others. And so thoughts that I heard in a county that really has no immigrants was how can we take care of immigrants if we can't even take care of ourselves as an argument against a broader social safety net. And, and, and you know, and it's not just in, in Appalachia, these kinds of, um, th these kinds of memes and thoughts pop up in other places that probably have never seen a person of color or a, a Hispanic or an immigrant. Um, there's this other place that I, I write a little bit about, which is in uh, Fr Fremont in Nebraska. Um, there are really no immigrants in Fremont, Nebraska, maybe, you know, 10. Um, but in 2010, and again in 2014, the people of Fremont, Nebraska voted in referenda for the toughest municipal ordinance against illegal immigrants in the United States. You know, it, it barred um, uh, employers from hiring illegal immigrants, which is already in federal law. So I don't know why they thought they had to do that again, but they put it in. And then they had an additional provision barring landlords from taking uh, illegal immigrants as tenants. Now, again, this is a place where there are no illegal immigrants. There are barely any immigrants, period. Uh, but still the sense of threat from a, you know, an abstraction um, was very real. And so kind of like to maybe to connect that better to your question, Maureen, um, maybe the, the thought is, and, and, and right now I'm, I'm coming to think about how a lot of the vote in the 2016 election for, for President Trump um, was in a lot of in counties where there were not a lot of, of people of color and not a lot of immigrants. So it's kind of like an argument, a political argument about how you know, brown swarthy immigrants were bad for us, played best or played particularly powerfully in places that did not really experience immigrants in, in, in a day-to-day -day life, for whom immigrants or people of color are more of a, an abstraction. And I sort of think that how these things affect the social safety net are as well like that. They're detached. It's not like you perceive, you know, there's a lot of, you know, Latinos and African Americans in my neighborhood. And then, oh, yeah, I can see that they're really lazy and living off of handouts. And that's how I build my belief. I think the beliefs are mediated through the political system. And in fact, the less you know about the real lives of people, uh, of people of color, of immigrants, uh, the, the easier it is for you to assume these kinds of attitudes that it's these guys that are just, you know, like leeches milking, milking the, the federal government. So I, I wanted to also ask you because um, about sort of the, the labor movement and you spend some time writing a, a little bit about it in, in your book and um, you know, and obviously sort of the labor movement, it's, it's only can be successful by sort of that's, 
people, it's a union, people working together in sort of solidarity towards a, towards a common purpose. And yet you'd sort of describe how some of the issues of racial animus kind of um, weakened it. It's, and it sort of has a complicated history growing up out of immigrant laborers and, and various things and um, so it's it's got a complicated history but you know but there's also so it, but it's n obviously not strong in the moment but there has been a resurgence of of labor activism in recent years both um, within traditional uni unions and in alternative forms and we are seeing much more diverse kinds of labor organizations so you know, how do you see sort of the role of worker organizing in the time of a very diverse workforce? How do you see that kind of going forward? And do you see any models of sort of worker voice or worker power that are working well? Yeah. Well, well taking a step back, uh, yeah, the American poison, uh, I, I write about the labor movement in American poison just to underscore how racism made it tough to create the kind of institutions that would um, help improve um, the working conditions of, 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 of American men and women. Um, you know, that, that it's, I, I noted in the history of, of organized labor, how divisions of race, you know, racism, you know, kind of like made it impossible to create a, you know, cross-racial, cross-ethnic labor movement. That, in my view, would have been much stronger uh, uh, and much more powerful. Um, and, 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 and so just racism got in the way. That's just one particular instance in how I see uh, racism warping our institutions in a way that undermines us as a society. But now thinking about the present and into the future. I mean, I think, you know, things like the fight for 15 do sort of like justify a hope that kind of new kinds of labor activism might improve jobs and living standards and uh, and, and so I, I really take a take a, 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 a lot of hope from that but I would still say that resurgence is perhaps a strong word here I mean we are living in a country in which most workers do not have voice I mean the unionization rate is what around seven percent um, and and as far as I can tell it's been you know it has not rebounded. It's pretty much either, either stuck or in continuous decline. Um, and, but, and, but I would agree that one of the most important challenges we have to overcome now to improve the lives of working women and men is to find ways to give workers voice, to give them more leverage at the bargaining table. Uh, and, and that goes through some form of labor organization. What kind of models are available out there? You know, you look around the world, people talk a lot about Germany, right? Where they have things like sectoral bargaining, where you're bargaining, you know, you're sitting around the table and you're bargaining for, um, you know, the entire steel industry um, or the, the entire automaking industry. And that is kind of an effective way of what they, what they call taking wages out of competition. So you're not gonna compete by, by paying less. Um, in Germany, they also, there's also uh, union representatives on corporate boards, which also helps, you know, companies keep the interest of their workers in mind. Now, whether that can work in the American political system uh, is uncertain, and, and I would not hold my breath. I mean, I'm kind of trying to remember back when, when uh, the Volkswagen opened a plant, was it in one of the Carolinas, and the, the German chief executive was encouraging the union to, the workers to join the union, and it was the governor of the state that actually came out against it, uh, trying to stop them from unionizing. So anyhow, I, I, I'm not sure that looking to Germany, um, um, it, it, I mean, it would be great, but I think we have several political hurdles between now and then. And then the broader thought, the broader thought connecting it to my general thinking in, in, in American Poison is that to succeed, the labor movement really needs to invite the new America in, you know, and the new America today, it means people of color and actually very especially immigrants and their kids. Um, and that we have good models out there. Uh, the Service Employees International Union has been actually great at working with uh, Latino immigrant communities for a long, long time. I'm thinking way back to the 1990s, the Justice for Janitors campaign on the, in the, on the West Coast. 
Um, Unite Here, the for hotel uh, hotel workers is also really good, and they happen to have memberships that are extremely diverse, with lots of immigrants, lots of Latinos, but not exclusively uh, um, uh, Latinos, and so. I, I think that that these kinds of, of of unions, which actually not coincidentally are the strongest unions in the country, uh, suggest to us that you know a, la a labor movement of the future to have any power has to be very aggressive about being about everybody, about representing everybody, and it's not super clear to me that the entire labor movement understands this. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, not that long ago to um, the, the kind of like the early mid 2000s, the AFL-CIO had a real hard time trying to support um, um, immigration reform. You know, there was this effort under the George W. Bush administration to, to create an, an, an immigration reform package that would, that would um, open a road towards, towards legalization and ultimately citizenship for undocumented immigrants in the United States. And the, I remember the AFL was really twisted into a pretzel uh, over that. It um, kind of like saw the idea of immigrant work as in a way a, a competition to native workers. And so, I mean, so there is, just to say that it's not really clear to me that the entire labor movement has really thought this through. Um, but um, I do think that this has to be an, a really overt and important part of the strategy. Yeah. Um, now, um, I think that these new models that you're referring to, kind of fight for 15 type, they're really interesting strategies. They're not going after, you know, collective bargaining, but they're going after legislation and changing legislation at the state level has proven, you know, they've been able to do this. And uh, so I think that that is, we should be looking for new levers beyond the traditional, you know, kind of like, you know, sitting down with management to negotiate wages and, and, and benefits. Um, and, but I think that ultimately this is a political battle and, um, and I think that the stronger the labor movement makes itself by including more of, of this country, the, the stronger it will be to, to, to wage it. Um, and maybe but I have one last little thought about this. I'm, I don't want to ramble on too long, but I think COVID is going to raise a question for me. Um, because, and, and I think I was talking about this with you before, Maureen, it was that I kind of suspect that coming out of COVID, the, the push for automation in companies across the country is going to be very strong. The kind of like worker replacement ethos that has been with us for some time is going to come out e resurgent out of this. You know, for the standard health reasons, gosh, you know, my workers get this thing and I can't keep my factory open, so let's get rid of workers kind of thing. So I see that, and so I think that the job for organized labor right now is going to get way more difficult. It's going to get really, really tough. Um, and so, you know, I think that the argument for really strategically thinking this through and, 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 and building, uh, uh, building political power is just all the, most, all the more important. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that a little bit more. Let's talk about sort of the implications of the of the COVID-19 crisis, because, you know, sort of we have this situation right now. We're all kind of in our homes. Right. Me with my fake background, um, you know, sort of we're all separated from each other, maybe with our families or with a couple of roommates or something. But, you know, we're not we're not sort of interacting with people very much. Um, at the same time, we sort of see some common news and we're experiencing kind of a, a common threat, um, maybe not all common news, but, um, and, you know, and, and I think that um, it's been interesting sort of seeing the ways in which some, some sort of kinds of workers have been uh, lifted up and sort of newly recognized in terms of the value that they bring if we think about workers in grocery stores. Um, workers in the food chain, workers in the healthcare industry, particularly sort of lower, you know, not just the doctors and nurses, but also the certified nurse aides and the sort of technicians and stuff. So, 
you know, so I'm curious, in, in some ways we seem more divided than others, but in other ways it seems like we're more willing to sort of see our need for a kind of common supports and insurances and, and, and help. How do you see this crisis affecting kind of our politics and our policy choices? I think what the outcome is going to be, you know, after this has come and gone and uh, um, is a really interesting question, but I think there's too much uncertainty between now and then to actually make a, any sort of definite answer. Um, you, you could, and I've been thinking of stories to write for the paper, for the Times about this, and one of the stories, one of the ideas that has been bouncing around in my head is, will we come out of this with a stronger support for the social safety net? You know, uh, uh, I remember when the great when the Great Recession hit and the, after the housing crisis in 2008, the Obama administration really, really had the battle to get past a, a fiscal stimulus that was smaller, that it was less than a trillion dollars, and it actually passed without a single Republican vote. Now, flash forward to the present, we passed a two trillion package with like a week of debate, and I think everybody voted for it. So like, uh, the, 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 you could say, well, okay, so we're frankly, might, maybe we're recognizing that having a social safety net is kind of useful, you know? Um, but, you know, I am not enormously optimistic in this kind of forecast. Um, I was talking to uh, um, this historian at Stanford who wrote a book about how the only moments in which, you know, humanity has managed to really, really reduce income inequality have been in really big crises, like massive wars, pandemics, uh, natural calamities. And he has, you know, he goes back and looks back through the Stone Age up until the, you know, to the late 20th century. And, you know, and, and so I asked him, I called him up and I asked him, you know, does this measure up to the kind of thing that, you know, that will really get us? And, you know, is that, you know, nope, <laughs> nope. It's like, you know, this, this, you really need the, the, the call to arms that you need to really justify this kind of a rethinking of society is a really, really uh, um, big lift. Now, hmm. also I wanted to, you know, I'm going to tip my hat to the sense of, you know, of community that COVID has built in some places, but I have a hard time running with it very far. I, I think it's probably true of many people that have done amazingly altruistic things and are donating their time and putting their health at risk, to be sure. But across society, um, I'm not convinced, and, and, and in particular, I mean, if you look at how the epidemic, who the epidemic has hit, I mean, it's really hard to buy into the notion that this is a common threat. You know, I think it, it, maybe you point out this moment ago, but you know, uh, uh, in Chicago, the share of African Americans dying of COVID is double their share in the population. Mm -hmm. You know, the death rate of Latinos in New York City is double the rate for non-Hispanic whites. You know, if you go to Manhattan, the the uh, uh, the infection rate per capita is about half, or even or less than half, than it is in the Bronx. So, uh, common threat is, you know, uh, let's take it with a grain of salt here. Um, and so, so this is really, I mean, what this threat has done is it has, in fact, it is really reiterated, reinforced the kind of like structural inequities that have been with us for a really long time. And I don't really see that changing. As we go back to work, I see that, you know, especially if automation is a, is, is a bigger deal, I think that the people on the bottom half of the, of the wage scale are going to have a way harder time uh, getting their finances and their lives back in order than people, you know, on, you know uh, uh, higher up on, on the ladder. Um, and, and, but at one point, though, I also, and this is, it's clearly affected the, 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 the poor, lower income, and it's clearly affected the black and the brown. And, way disproportionately. I'm not sure that that will be true, you know, one or two months from now, because I think what's happened now is that COVID has really attacked urban centers most, they're more densely populated and so forth. But when COVID moves over to less populated uh, uh, parts of the country, that's where poor white America predominantly lives. So I would not be surprised to see this kind of disparate impact on the poor there, but the poor there are gonna be more often white than they are here. So um, um, 
So, so, so just to say, I don't, I don't really see this as a common thread. I think this is a very, very differentiated threat. And then what comes to mind is again, well, what's our shortcoming vis-a-vis -vis other countries that have dealt with this thing? Why are we doing particularly badly? And well, it's the, well, yeah, it's the social safety net thing. We just didn't have one, you know? I mean, alone among the world's rich countries, the US is facing the epidemic with 27 million people that don't have health insurance. We are facing it with the stingiest unemployment insurance system in amongst the rich countries in the OECD. We don't have mandatory sick leave. We have virtually no uh, um, uh, mandatory uh, childcare. So, you know, we're, we're entering this with a real, really soft underbelly, you know? I mean, if anything, this is, you know, proving to us that public goods are actually very val val valuable, excuse me, and the U.S. was really kind of foolish not to build some. Um, I, I, uh, in, in other talks I've given about, about this book, about American poison, I often stop at, you know, one of the things that, 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 that I stopped to mention is, is America's infant mortality rate, because that's, thinking back to how I got to this book, that was one of the first stats that I looked at and said, what? You know, infant mortality in the U.S. Um, is amongst the highest in the, in the OECD. You know, it's maybe fourth from the bottom, you know, Chile, Mexico, Turkey might be below, but it's really scraping the bottom. Um, and what's weird is like we have one of the most sophisticated healthcare systems in the, in, in the world. A lot of the technologies that have been developed to keep premature babies alive were developed in this country by American scientists. And yet we have kind of like the uh, infant mortality rate of Croatia. And so like, to me, that's always been a, you know, perfect illustration of uh, what happens when you do not build the kind of safety net welfare system apparatus to put a floor uh, under the, the, the lives of, of um, people on, on, on the unfortunate side of life. But now I think the COVID offers even a, you know, uh, um, uh, as good or better an example of that. You know, we are suffering, um, um, uh, very, very high death rates compared to other rich countries. We have been very, very, had a very, very hard time in slowing this down. We've had, we've been, we've come very close to, to face shortage of hospital beds, shortage of ventilators. And, and, and again, you know, we do have this with 27 million that don't have health insurance and their odds of going to the hospital and, 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 and are, are probably going to be pretty depressed because of that. Um, and the other day I was reading about just to finish this thought, the other day I was reading about Sweden. Now, Sweden is following an entirely different strategy for COVID. It's, it's kind of like they've let people, you know, out in the streets. They didn't close schools. They didn't close businesses. They sort of asked people if they could to maintain social distance, but this was kind of voluntary. And in part, it's because I guess the Swedes are sort of like respect authority more maybe, and so they, they voluntarily stayed at home and things. Uh, but also, um, what I've read is that Sweden is kind of pursuing more of a strategy of herd immunity. Like the idea that if enough of their population gets, gets this, this virus, um, you know, the, the, the country as a whole will become more or less immune. And numbers that I've seen is that you need about two thirds of the population to, to, to have been hit by the virus to achieve this sort of herd immunity. Um, and so I was thinking, well, how come Sweden follows that strategy when well, certainly we're not. We're trying to, to, to the best we can to really tamp down on the disease. And one of the thoughts that came is, well, you know what? Sweden has a much, much stronger uh, uh, health and healthcare infrastructure than we do. I mean, like in terms of available beds and available respirators and available phys physicians, you know, so, so the, the U.S. has 2.6 doctors per thousand people. Sweden has 4.1 in, in its public healthcare system, by the way. Um, and also because of this kind of like more robust safety net, one of the things is, is that Sweden does not really suffer a lot of the really bad health outcomes that are uh, one of the consequences of America's more entrenched and deeper poverty. So their life expectancy is higher, they have fewer uh, chronic conditions, their obesity rate is lower, they have less diabetes, they have less cancer, you know, uh, across the board, you see what I interpret as the outcomes of a healthier society that has been kept healthier by a very, very generous, uh, well, much more generous than the United States, investment in kind of public goods. 
to keep so many people from falling through the cracks. And well, then that allows them to, you know, to think, okay, well, I can let more people get infected. There's going to be probably less of them to get really terminally ill. And my healthcare system is more support, it has, has more capacity to support how, however many ill people we've got. And so it said, well, okay. So, you know, the, the, we were unable to build such a safety net. And so, you know, one of the things that that did was it closed off an opportunity. We could never do that because we have so many people on the, you know, on the bottom end of those rungs of health and income and living conditions. And we have a hospital system that really is nowhere near the capacity to support a really big surge in this, that, you know, that is really not available to us. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, Maureen. Yeah, no, that's great. So I'm taking a couple of questions from the audience now, because I can see we're, we're kind of getting a little close to time. So I'm going to ask you two that have been passed along by my colleagues. Um, uh, and um, so one is, what lesson should be taken from the current COVID crisis and earlier crises about the role of reparations that, that should or could play in the future of our political economy? And the other question is, on top of the divides mentioned, class, race, geography, have you looked into the role of faith traditions in the decades that you've been doing research and, and what have you learned about uh, the role of, of faith traditions? So if you have a couple quick answers on, on those, because I do also want to ask you before we go to say, give some examples of things you found that, that also gave you hope, right? Sort of what are some things that gave you hope and maybe we can build on? Okay, so these are difficult questions. Yeah. And they're questions that often get me in trouble. <laughs> um, so, so, so let, let me let me address the the um, the geographical distribution question. Are there different expressions of racial hostility ar ar around the country? And my answer to that is, for sure, yes. Um, um, you know, and there's been not only different expressions of racism, but like a, a very, very uh, a different history of how of, of racism and how it has um, affected our um, um, our politics and our institutions um, um, is in, it has has been very very different. You know, you have and so for instance, you have the South, which is kind of like the the cradle uh, um, of, of, of racial discrimination and segregation because there's historical association with with slavery, of course, um, and you know, and the South, in the South in its history had, for instance, one of the most aggressive uh, integrations of the educational system in the country following court desegregation orders starting in the 60s and 70s, which is, you know, kind of like goes against the grain of what one, what one thinks of the South. But then on the other hand, you know, this very effort towards desegregation delivered the South forever to a party that is today trying to attach worker requirements to food stamps and Medicaid. So, you know, and, and, and the Northeast and the Midwest had a different set of, 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 of racial conflicts. I mean, you know, there's a standard belief that for a long time, there was a standard belief that um, um, segregation and racial discrimination were Southern problems. And so a lot of the, the, the court and solutions to, you know, to desegregate um, were, were seen as not necessarily in the, in the Northeast and the Midwest. That proved to be a really big lie because the, the, you know, the, the migration of, of African-Americans north starting around World War I and well you know, up until the 1970s was met with an enormous hostility by whites in the north. I mean, um, you can you know, just look at the history of Detroit, for instance, and like some, some in Newark, you know, massive uh, uh, racial riots, enormous conflict with, you know, b between black neighborhoods and white police forces. Um, and then in terms of the, in terms of school, uh, of, of integration, you know, even as the South was making enormous inroads in integrating, inter integrating its schools, um, the, 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 the Northeast and the Midwest were maintaining the extremely segregated school systems. Uh, and they became, and the, the, the school systems in the South became more integrated than school systems in the North um, um, around the 1990s and the 2000s. What's more, you know, res, you know, residential segregation in cities in the Northeast and the Midwest was it was really, really intense up to, you know, peaking in the 1970s. So the idea that there, this was an area of, you know, less racial con conflict or 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 or, or or more, or more uh, um, racial harmony in industrial America. I mean, should should 
<laughs> look again. The West, the experience of the West, again, is more mixed and also because I think they're Lat Latinos and Asians in, in a way kind of like contributed to the story and I think changed the story in a substantial way. I mean, I think in a way they, they kind of acted as a buffer between the black white divide. And so the black white divide was like, like less prominent in the history of this region. I mean, this created other dividing lines and I do talk about them in the book, which you know, notably in, in California, the black brown uh, uh, conflict has been, you know, has had its uh, um, pretty dark moments. Um, and, but I think that over, overall there, if you look at, you know, patterns of segregation and so forth, it kind of looks less intense um, because of this richer ethnic mix, because you'll have, you know, you'll have Latinos in the neighborhood, you'll have Asians in the neighborhood, and you'll, you'll have uh, um, uh, non-Hispanic whites in the, in the neighborhood. Yeah. But I, so I, I want to move you to, to saying a little of, about, about reparations. That's the one yeah. that gets me in trouble. Okay, um, so you can skip reparations and talk a little bit about because we just have a few minutes left. Oh, okay. and so, sorry. Sorry, it's taking so long. So, so, so okay. uh, it would be great. It would actually be really great to just hear about what gives you hope because I think that that would be helpful. Okay, yeah. so let, so what gives me hope? I, you know, all right. The U.S. for all the kind of like dismal sort of events in our the history of our racial relations we did have you know the civil rights act we did have the voting rights act we did have brown versus board of education we did have the fair housing act there have been uh moments in our history when we've been able if only you know momentarily to push back against discrimination and segregation often at the cost of a lot of violence and 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 and, and you know uh, the lives of, of, of people of color, but we have been able to push, there has been success at moments of pushing against uh, um, this, this uh, against racism and towards creating the idea of a more inclusive society. And so I take some hope from that. And if you tell me where, where would I put, where would I look more intensely? Where would I think that that, that offers most promise? I would think I would argue that the, the, the area of most promise is the area of residential integration, where we live, who we live with, who we live among. To my mind, that action there carries the most promise for us to be able to build a more kind of like an inclusive society, a more inclusive sense of what it means to be an American. Um, and that there are some moments of hope there too, you know, uh, residential segregation in urban America was intense in the 1970s. And that's, you know, the late 1960s was this moment where, you know, riots happened all, all across cities uh, in the Northeast and the Midwest, where, you know, the Kerner Commission was appointed to look at, you know, are we going up in flames, uh, you know, and, and, and then somehow out of this experience, uh, you'd say from the ashes of Detroit, the U.S. sort of changed direction. And if you look at, at, at residential uh, li uh, um, living patterns by race, um, you know, from the 1970s up until, you know, not that long ago, in fact, perhaps by some studies even continuing today, the U.S. looks, at least urban U.S., looks less and less segregated, more mm. diversified, you know, um, um, you so, know, in the 1980s. The average white person lived in a neighborhood where 88% of the population was white. And by 2010, she lived in a neighborhood where 75% was white. So there's been, there's been a kind of like, it, we're nowhere near where we've got to be, but that movement is, I think, I, is, 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 a, is a dynamic that offers some hope. But I'm not saying well. that <laughs> or, or even that it's going to continue or even that this is as good as I think it might be but it is a place that I look for, for progress. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Eduardo, it's always such a pleasure to talk to you and it's been a fascinating conversation. And I think, you know, the idea of, of sort of integrated living leading to other things is, is a great one to lead with. It gives state, fed, a local, state, federal, all a role in thinking about where they, where they play and, and, and 
lots of folks can can think about what their role is in, in moving forward. So, um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, like I said, it's, a, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I could talk to you for another hour, but I think uh, we'd end up losing everybody. Um, I want to thank our audience again for joining us. Um, it, um, it was great to have you with us today. Many thanks again to my Aspen Institute colleagues who, who do such a fabulous job in organizing these things. Um, please do take a moment to respond to our quick feedback survey um, at the close of this webinar or send us an email at eop.aspeninstitute.org. Let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you and we hope you'll join us again. Thank you.